moderator and panel members, esteemed Vice President, Vice Chancellor and Co-Vice Chancellor of ASU University, respected coordinators of the conclave, delegates, invited guests, members of faculty and staff, and my student fellows. I, Prerna Das, on behalf of ASPM University, would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone attending the plenary session of the National Law Conclave 2023 on the theme, Role of the Judiciary in a Changing World. For this session, we have a with us, galaxy of intellectuals and some of the best minds in this world. We feel honored to have with us Professor Rangin Pallav Tripathi, Registrar, National Law University, Odisha. Professor Tripathi has been teaching at National Law University, Odisha since 2010 and works in the area of constitutional governance, civil liberties, criminal law and human rights. His current research focuses on the functioning of institutions within constitutional democracy and the way they expect the realization of democratic rights. He was a full bright postdoctoral research scholar at Howard Law School, where he researched the competing methods of appointing judges in democracies. His doctoral thesis is the first work of its kind in India on the performance of evaluation of judges in the higher judiciary. He has completed two research projects funded by the Department of Justice, <laughs> Government of India in the area of judicial reforms. He has also provided consultancy services to the Odessa Judicial Academy to prepare research materials for judicial officers. We welcome you, sir. <laughs> we are extremely delighted to have with us Mr. Abhani Kumar Sahu, Advocate Supreme Court of India. Mr. Sahu did his B.A. Economics Honours from Vikram Dev College. He did his LLB from the University of Delhi. Mr. Sahu was the founder convener of Lok Adalat in 1986, appointed by Justice P.N. Bhagwati. He started law practice under Ram Jaitmani in 1988. He began in UN Vienna in 2005 and represented India with former Attorney General V.K. Venugopal in China in 2006. He represented India at Global Peace Conference USA in 2007 and at Judicial Academy USA in 2010. Since 1988, he is a practicing advocate in the Supreme Court of India. We welcome you, sir. We are extremely elated to have with us Mr. Arunav Patnaik, advocate Supreme Court of India. He is a graduate of economics from St. Stephen College, Delhi and an LLB from Delhi University. Mr. Patnaik was enrolled at the bar in the year 2003. He has worked under Sri Gopal Subramanian, Senior Advocate, former Solicitor General for about five years. We welcome you, sir. <laughs> we are extremely delighted to have with us Mr. Devashish Nair, President of the Consumer Dispute Redressal Commission, Qatar. After completing his LLM and PG in English, he started his career as a law lecturer at JR Law College in 1986. He joined Odisha Judicial Service in the year 1990. He has worked as SDGA and Senior Civil Judge Bhumeshwar, Deputy Registrar Admin, Registrar Judicial in the High Court of Odisha. After superannuation, he became a legal consultant to the Odisha State Legal Authority, legal advisor to the Department of Works, Government of Odisha, legal expert for OBCC and at present District Consumer, Dispute Redressal Commission President, Qatar. We welcome you, sir. Now, I would like to request Professor Rangin Pallav Tripathi, Registered National Law University, Odisha, to steer the discussion forward as the moderator of this session. Uh, so, thank you for that kind introduction. And firstly, my heartiest congratulations to the team at the ASBM University and the School of Law for organizing this event and for gathering this crowd. Which we often talk about on an everyday basis, but in my estimation, we rarely talk about it in the right way. There are things that we discuss often. But discussing things every day, discussing things in the right manner, there can often be a difference. Uh, I am, uh, I feel slightly victimized, right, I'll be honest. 
because the, the request should deal with the moderator of the session. And as a moderator, uh, my role is slightly different than what it should be as a panel member. Because uh, judiciary and judicial reforms has been a, a subject extremely dear to me. Uh, that was the subject of my reservation. That was the subject of my PhD thesis. That was the subject of my postdoctoral research. And I have written extensively on, on this area. Uh, so while I might now and then succumb to my natural instinct of uh, giving opinions, pardon me for that because that ideally is not the role of the moderator. My primary role today is to facilitate a discussion on this issue uh, amongst our esteemed panel members who have come here today. Uh, so we were just sitting down earlier during lunch and just having a chat about how we should go about it. And the unanimity that we reach was that it should not be long monologues. That this should be more of a discussion where we pick up some issues, we pick up some questions and all panel members can give their opinion on them and then move on to also questions and answers and opinions from the uh, audience. Uh, I'll just give some brief remarks before I uh, move on to the panel members and request them to start the discussion. Uh, here is one thing which I've always found extremely fascinating. Uh, the fact that judiciary as an independent organ of governance is the youngest institution in this world. Came around only 400, 500 years ago. When you look at the idea of an executive, thousands of years ago. When you look at the idea of a legislature, thousands of years ago. We have always been judging. There has always been people who perform the judicial work, who perform the judicial function, but they were often merged with whoever already had the executive power or the legislative power. Think back to ancient India. It was kings who dispensed justice. They were the epitome of who will be the final arbiter of justice in a particular, uh, particular jurisdiction. Being such a young institution, which is only a couple of hundred years old, in its, in its modern sense, in its modern iteration, today, over the last two centuries, all over the world, especially in India over the last 30 years, there is no aspect of a common person's life that is not touched by what the judiciary does. Starting from whether our drinking water is clean or not, uh, then whether we can build a house in a particular area or not, whether COVID vaccine should be free or not, almost every single aspect of our existence there is judicial involvement in that. And it is fascinating to understand this, that what has contributed to the rise of judiciary at such ferocious speed. So that's just, that's just something I wanted to share with you all. So I move on to my uh, panel members. And uh, uh, I'll when we begin, I just request all three panel members, including Mr. Uh, Sam, to you know outline in maybe you know, five minutes what they think is the biggest challenge facing the judiciary. We know that judiciary is facing a lot of challenges, but if we have to prioritize, if we have to create a hierarchy about what is the challenge that needs to be addressed now, not one minute later, what that challenge will be according to. So we'll start with Mr. Sahu and Mr. Nai. Is there a The guys of that. Hopefully, the very few law students are here, but law professors and law, uh, law students from the different uh, law schools are there. I think management uh, students are there. It will be very interesting. What is the challenge before the, I mean, the Indian democracy today? First, I can say the corruption, the delinquency of the executive to follow the rules properly. The delinquency of the, of the executive, when they don't follow the rules properly, then the litigation starts, then they come to the court for the adjudication. 
and corruption is rampant everywhere. That is the root cause of all. I mean, everything, every needs of the society is there. And next is the environment and the infrastructure that is your carbon development. If you, government is concentrating at one place, they expanding the carbon development. So employment created only in a particular metropolis where the villages are totally empty because there is no employment, people are migrated to urban areas. So Gandhi says the life should start from the villages, but just reverse I mean the government is doing. But now the present government has been creating more metros, more small, small cities. Otherwise the youngsters will go for the employment where the urban areas. Urban development is a root cause of all the crimes, maximum crimes in the country today. Because if you are concentrating in one place, maximum people are been coming for the employment, migration is there, demand is there, then the crime will definitely increase. Then the people are been, even the officers, demand is also more. Are they phone nature here? Go for team four, are the large gallery, team the char gallery. So all these things should be controlled by the judiciary. We say that the judiciary can control us. Very difficult to say. But first, my experience in the corruption, I had got, I mean, the practice in the Supreme Court to bring the rule of law and reality. Once I got this case about the Hawala case, you must have heard about the Jain Hawala. Hawala money used to come from abroad. You must have heard about the Jain Hawala case, anybody? That is an uh, law students can study the Vinay Tarak President of India. That case was going on for uh, four or five years in Supreme Court. So all top people, top ministers, cabinet ministers, governors used to get hawala money from abroad to please uh, some businessman or some political funding and all these things. When the CBI raised, I mean raided one place and one student from uh, JNU and uh, caught him he got all the documents, how the money used to be given to all the politicians for the Jammu Kashmir militants. The student was from Jammu Kashmir militants. For a militant activities, the Hawala money used to come at one channel. The same channel used to give the money to different politicians. When the CBI read it and got the documents from the Jain diary, the money used to be paid from many ministers, cabinet ministers during Nashwara's time. Then, then somebody leaked out, we did not the journalist, that it came to us. I was Ram Jaipalak at the time. So we drafted the petition and filed it in the Supreme Court. It came before one chief justice, Justice uh, Venkatsharya. Then he said, you are successionalizing the whole thing. It was very difficult to get lawyers. Ram Jaipal written a letter to the Prime Minister. He said, I cannot be a lawyer. I want to, I mean, give a lawyer. Let us see, I mean, who is the lawyer? We requested Anil Jivan to be a lawyer. But I kept four lawyers, like Satyabhushan, who recently died, one of the very prominent lawyers, and Tarkunde, Arun Jaitri, and uh, Anil Diwan. So it changes one court to others. Once it came before Vagarcharya, then it came before Mohan, then it came before the Shranath. The Shranath said, why do you go to the magistrate? You find a PRU for the rule of law, for investigation against all these people. We, we knew about all the recipients. When it came before Justice Varma, when it came before Justice Venkatsharya for 75 times. Every time you assure us that I will give you the whole day for argument, this is a very, I mean the corruption is a high basis, it should be caught and we should call the CBA for investigation. But 75th day also he said, why don't you come and uh, argue the matter. At that time actually my senior Anil one was not there, he was not there. He said, you argue the matter. I said, I cannot argue this matter. You said you will give me for two, three days. He give it. Let it come off your retirement. I am embarrassed. When it came before Justice Varma, then we took it as a new concept of uh, investigation. We asked, Justice Varma asked, why don't you find some lawyers to investigate? I said, it's very difficult to get lawyers. Then asked the CBA director to be here in the court. Then asked him, he came. Then with the in the concept of continuous maintenance comes. When you file a writ before any writ court like High Court and Supreme Court, they read the maintenance, they pass an order, then they forget their contempt issue, they will deal with that. Here we call the other continuous maintenance. The doctrine of continuous maintenance means 
CBI asked the CBI director to investigate a report. That the investigation was going on, reported to the Supreme Court, which asked about 34 politicians. Six cabinet ministers, city cabinet ministers had to design, two governors had to design, so asking was fine. But ultimately, we could not, I mean, Gopal Subramanian was the, I mean, special prosecutor at the time, we appointed him, and before the High Court. He also messed up the whole thing, but uh, I'm sorry, you know, your senior. Then asked, Mr. Jetwani used to appear, try to appear for Arbani. I said, how can you appear? You are, I mean, assisting me for the prosecution. How can you appear for the other side once the Arbani is seated? You can't do that. We protested against him. But still, he taken some permission from the Bar Council the chairman and on the general appear for Arbani. And what the case was. Brilliant criminal lawyer, of course, partially. But all the other they accused caught free. Then how to insulate the CBI in this fashion? Then we started, I mean, we broke the world class getting from the UK, USA, I mean, the model of FBI and everything. We wanted the CBI to be like the FBI model. But the CBI, CBI is a central agency. It's a borrowed agency, I can say, in the state. They cannot enter if the corruption is in the state. They have to take the permission. At least with the central, I mean, the corruption is there in the high places. At least it can catch those people. We wanted a tenure system for the director. We brought a tenure system, two years tenure system for the director. And today, you can say, and the CBC controls that, that act which was passed later on. But Supreme Court pass an order is a continuous matter. Till the legislation passed, we should have this kind of thing. Director CBI should be two, two years. And all the SP level officers, above SP level, not the director, they should be insulated. They should be, it should not be transferred out without the, I mean, uh, the permission of the panel. Panel is a high level panel. Let on the act camp. Now the CBA directors are appointed to the highest authority of the country. What we vision, we, we dream, direct of that. The Prime Minister, leader of the opposition, and the Chief Justice of India appoint the director of CBI. What more, uh, I mean, highest authority to be appointed is should be should be independent, should be meritorious, should be impartial. In the daytime, it will have been morning time, just as Patai said, very difficult to understand, very difficult to trust the police. It's the reality. I'm very closely I've been watching what the CBI is doing, what the CD is doing. Very difficult. Even the court cannot come and control that. Court cannot. So ultimately in a democracy they are under the executive. It depends on the person, who is the person. In the judicial corruption is no less. For the past 10 years, what's, I mean, watching the Supreme Court, how the Chief Justice bowed down before the executive. Recently, of course, we got a wonderful judge, Chief Justice. We have some hope, let us see, I mean, how we would do that. Because what more power you need after you become the Supreme Court judge? What should not hunger for the post retirement post? This is what I have never preferred a post retirement. Everybody is asked for the post retirement to be at a month in all this, I mean, the uh, facilities from the government. But after the Supreme Court judge, this is only the law that's controlling you. None else, nobody is watching you. At least we should do justice whenever the I mean, case comes to you. But the delay, because the delay people don't trust the judiciary today. That's a criminal threat in the society today to give the quick justice of UP and Bihar. They give the quick justice. So even Fulan Devi was my client. Mr. Khan, I could just request you. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. The limited time anyway, to the students that I can discuss all these things. The role of judiciary, they say, that for the change in the world. So every time new thing comes before the court, New legislation has to be made. When the PIL, when they say the Supreme Court passes some order, that becomes the law. But every time it's not a practical to implement those laws. Like Visaka is an absolutely, even 50% cases now abused, now thinking very seriously about it. For women children to keep an employment, it is a small allegation is there, that's also abused. So, judiciary is not a thing, which will only think they will make the law. When there is, a, there is a, some gap between the, the law made by the, I mean, the parliament or the legislation 
judiciary make the law. That's very difficult to implement. Judiciary is there for the adjudication. But sometimes when there is a gap, they should fill up to capture to the society. So I have no time to speak. So Mr. So Tripathi says actually you should be very short in telling. So in this matter, actually corruption is the biggest issue today, even in the judiciary, how to control it. Then only you will have a very peaceful life. Otherwise, you cannot. Thank you.
and other countries, UAE and all. The crime rate is just negligible. It is because they have Sharia law, which is retributive way of punishment, or tit for tat. If you do something, you get a hard blow. If you are a thief, they can cut off your hand. And like likewise, likewise. So maybe due to the fewer psychosis, the crime rate there is much low in comparison to that in India. Here, of course, we have one uh, this retributive way of punishment. If we remember, that is under section 302 of IPC, we take away a life in of the man who has taken a life. So this is the only retributive way of punishment available as per Indian penal code. So this change which is coming in India regarding judiciary requires to be fastened and sensitization is much required for the people to cope up with the growing crime rate like the cyber crimes, the offences against the women, and the heinous offences that are now taking place in the society. Maybe some of them are due to the lack of these politicians, influential persons, industrialists, and a person should not think that I should not get justice by going to the court. The idea that the justice is only for the influential persons, the persons who have money, should be wiped out. It is for this we have many systems like providing legal aid to a poor. There are categories of it. A lady can be given. Legal aid. legal aid means no money is given, of course, but a lawyer is to be provided free of cost till her, his or her, her case is completed. So, who are the persons are, uh, who are getting this? So, senior citizens, transgenders, uh, people from a riot area, children, women, uh, civil caste and civil crime persons, like that, there are 13 categories of persons, even if persons of economic class like whose salary is or income is around 3 lakhs per annum. So they also get free legal aid. For that we have also developed uh, this uh, uh, front offices. Front offices are there at every legal institution providing free legal aid to the uh, after hearing to the grievance of the person. A person who is agreed for any offence having been committed to him or to his relatives can approach the front offices and explain to the member sitting there who can guide him. It is like a clinic or the reception counter who will provide legal aid to the person who had approached and there are of course much more developments undergone. The case of Odisha in this aspect under the guidance of Honorable Justice S. Muralitha CJ, CJ of Odisha, Chief Justice of Odisha. We have developed much regarding this video conferencing and holding cases without calling the accused of the witnesses to the court. It is because the top uh, officials who were required to approach the court. Suppose a person who was there at Qatar and after an offence or any in matter in which he is to depose as a witness, he is now posted as Markanagi. Earlier it was there the system that he should come to the court and depose as a witness, wait till his term comes and again return to his working place. And for that, he has to take official leave and if a private person is to approach the court, he was paid part time. All these systems 
are now not required as per Odisha judiciary. Video conferencing has already started and we have some video conferencing systems in the district courts all over Odisha. Of course, there are questions if they are working properly or not. And yes, we have to improve, we will be improving and like uh, this uh, offenses to women and children. We have this. Uh, Sorry, we yeah. can just speak in yes. the yes. Okay, we'll have little discussions. I'm there, and uh, and then what's our time? Again, come to you, come back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a high task because while you come back to you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a high level task. Because while our desires to keep on listening to the great wealth of knowledge and experience that the panel people are sharing, we also have a time constraint in terms of managing various issues that we would like to talk about and also taking questions from the audience. So, pardon me, sir, for interrupting once in a while. I will keep doing that for the remainder of the uh, discussion as well. Now, <laughs> Because the idea is to keep it as informal as well. It's a balanced structure. We also take questions from the audience. Um, it was very enlightening to hear Mr. Sahu talk about his experience in the Janumala case, which was a very important case in the history industry, and which he has been writing about. He focused on corruption in the government or in high public functions. How that can be dealt with by the courts. Uh, Mr. Nayak, having a judicial background himself, spoke about the importance of court processes and implementation of the law properly inside the courtrooms for tackling of crimes in society, which is on the rights, which is a concern of the courts. Corruption and crime, definitely very, very important areas um, which are perpetual problems of society which the judiciary tries to deal To my mind, as a younger practitioner, much less experienced than then, when I look back, of having spent 20 years in practice, what I find is the most important challenge that we're facing right now in the judiciary is that of independence. Now, you as law students, in every year of your of your uh, learning in law school, you will be told about the importance of independence of judicial. And some of you will go on to become judicial officers and judges of high court, maybe Supreme Court. And some of you become strong advocates in the courtrooms. And when we are when we are law students, it's very difficult to understand what exactly is the meaning of independence judicial because it's a theoretical concept really. But when you become a practitioner and when you live the law every day in the courtrooms, what you realize is that judges who are sitting out there are human beings. They have been given certain protections to be independent in deciding every case without fear or favor. But being human beings, they do succumb to pressures. And these pressures do not look that problematic when the executive or the government is weak. So when we have long era coalition politics, we have a very strong independent activist tradition. But a new problem comes up every time we have a very, very strong executive which is the political government in power. So what we are experiencing now in the courtrooms, which I think is the most urgent issue or the most problematic issue right now, is that we do not get a sense as young practitioners, 20 years young, the field like law, that the courts and judges are doing their jobs in an independent, fearless manner. And we all know that we have a strong government in power. The government has a very large majority. 
no matter what one's ideology is, because the government is at power because of large people in the country support the government and vote for this government power. One can have one's own one ideology, but when cases come before the courts, no matter whose case it is, even when the government is involved, the judge should decide the case fearlessly, without any fear or without any expectation of any favor. And that becomes an issue when the government is very powerful. We faced similar problems in the 1970s when Mrs. Indira Gandhi was in power. It had the Mrs. Gandhi's government had completely opposite ideology of what this government had had in this time. And they wanted the judiciary to be committed to their cause. So the government of that time, you will get learned in your legal history classes, had done two super sessions. Two Supreme Court Chief Justices, normally the senior most person in Supreme Court becomes, gets to become CGI. The senior most person in the Supreme Court, on two occasions when Mr. Gandhi was in power, was not allowed to become the CGI. And that was a very strong message you sent out to the judiciary that if you do not listen to the government, you will be punished. So you have to fall in line. Today we have not seen such superstition as yet. Thank you. But we do get a sense that somewhere judges are not acting that independently and that strongly as they expected. They do not take up issues and deal with them as forthrightly as partly as they should. I think that's the most pressing need of the times today. So I just stop at that. Because I'm going to doesn't put me up or going to my Thank you. Thank you so much. So in the initial uh, setting of agenda, we have three, you know, three issues which are proposed. One is, uh, as pointed out, Professor Sahu, also, that you tend to report how the judiciary is going to tackle corruption committed by other organs of government. And the one that Mr. Knight flag is about corruption within the judiciary as well. And uh, the one that is flagged by Mr. Patnaik is about judiciary not being able to function in an independent manner. Now, this takes me back to you know my PhD thesis, and there's a, there's a sub-chapter of judicial independence, and uh, my theorization was this, that, Mr. Patnaik, my next question will be for you. Uh, we have these judicial independence measures in the constitution and our laws, like uh, security of tenure, that you cannot be removed in the pressure, uh, that your salary cannot be reduced uh, while you are in service and additionally there are some other protection measures. Uh, my theory at the time was, uh, which I developed after reading a lot of literature on that, that there are primarily three kinds of judges. Judges will be independent no matter what. They don't need security of tenure, they don't need security of salary, they don't need any protection, they don't need any comfort, they will be independent and morally correct because that's who they are. You cannot bribe them. You cannot put fear in them. They are, they are what to say, unbreakable. We don't need judicial protection measures for them because they will stand up to power regardless. Of them. Then there are judges who will be corrupt regardless. Of them. No matter how many perks you provide them. No matter how much salary you pay them, no matter how many facilities you provide them, they will be corrupt. That's in their nature. These two extremes are occupied by human beings who have extreme nature. Somebody who is extremely good, extremely ethical, and, and, and cannot depend by anybody. And somebody who is promiscuous by nature. It's those in the middle who are on the edges who want to be independent but do not have that fear in this That even if I face the prizes, I'll be independent. Even if something happens to me, I'll be independent. I might lose my job, but I'll be independent. They want to be honest. They want to be ethical. But they are the ones who are prone to waver when there is pressure. So, uh, uh, Mr. Patnaik, in the last 20 years that you have been, and when you talk about 
judges today not being able to be as independent as we expect them to be. Would you reckon that one of the possibilities is that we do not have many judges of the first category in our, in our education? That takes me back to what Mr. Sahu said in his speech. He said that let's look at Supreme Court judges. You will see the dog there, you have secret tenure, you have so much. What more do you want? Is the first question. I, I, and you are, you, are, you, you are wondering as to whether we don't have people of this campus and that, and what the real reason as to why this is there. I think. And let's understand judiciary comprises of people drawn from our society the various. In your own classroom as students, you will see and look up to somebody in your classroom. You may not be the brightest boy in class, brightest girl in class. But something in that person, whether man or girl, stands up for certain values and ideas. And he's not going to budge. If he makes up his mind, sometimes you find him. Look up to him. We always have experiences. Same thing happens in society. In every family, we know that you know, this uncle of mine will stand by what he thinks is right. When we go, whether it's bureaucracy, whether it is academic institutions, wherever, we know in the academic institution itself, we know some people will stand for what is right, and some people will agree to what Mr. Rizmir Pertain says every, every day. Okay. So, because of the most powerful man on this campus. I'm just saying, I'm just giving an example that. There is a power hierarchy in every place, but there are some people who will stand up for this right. There are some people who will just give to whatever power hierarchy tells them. That's a typical problem I think uh, judiciary also faces. It's no different. There are some individuals who just stand up no matter what. They may not be the most brilliant. Just as uh, Mr. Sao mentioned, was actually one of the most brilliant judges. Justice Chandra Chuk was also the most brilliant legislator of the Australian Supreme Unfortunately, you know, the spade, a spade, a spade, these two judges crumbled when it came to independent judiciary in the ADM Jones Court case. It's one case which you probably also read. Now, what happened to this brilliant man? Why could they not stand up? Well, they were required to stand only yesterday. Chal Khanna that's one name you get to hear of the game. I'm throwing these names because young people's minds, when you read judgments, Later, you will get to know, okay, this is the judges. These are Bhagavati, General Chur, the Chapna, the historical names of the English Supreme Court. You get to hear. What differentiated HR Khanna from Justice Bhagavati and Justice General Chur is simply a steadfastness of character which was inherent. There's one joke which goes that Ms. Soliswar kept in the column, he used to write the column, no more. Lost almost the bar last few years. He wrote a piece in the Indian Express in his column that he was sitting with Mrs. Nani Pankiwala, one of the greatest lawyers in India has seen so far in India. When the ADM Jaukur judgment came out, and it was a judgment, to just put it simply for young students, was about suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. And writ of habeas corpus basically is is a bit where you, you cannot just imprison anybody without the rule of law, without ordering due process of law. So that, during emergency, Mrs. Gandhi, who I mentioned again, we all know is a great Prime Minister of the matter, what the other history is. She had suspended the writ, the writ of previous corpus, uh, powers of the courts, and that was another challenge. That can you arrest somebody without ordering due process of law? The matter, the Madhya Pradesh High Court took a view that no, you cannot do that. That is something so intrinsic of fundamental right, so intrinsic rule of law, you cannot do that. Matter went to the Supreme Court. When the decision came out, Ms. Sony Sudhakya was sitting with Ms. Nani Bhadgiva. They thought that the two Bombay judges, great Bombay judges, General Chur and Justice Bhagavad, the great Liberty, uh, upholding the liberty, will definitely go against the government and uphold the liberty. It is purpose, purpose. 
Um, they start, the other judges, I don't want to even leave them, not even worth naming, will definitely go with Indira Gandhi. And they're not sure which way Ajahn Khanna will go. Because he's unsure, they, nobody knew much about him. Then he, had, he was not to be a judge of the bench. When the judgment came out, it was 4 is to 1. Four judges had gone with the government. And one went, one stood up for independence of judiciary and the right of previous Congress and the rights of people not to be to the process of uh, imprisonment or any punishment under the law without process of following the process of law. Only a chapter has stood up. So, Soli Suraji, Balki Wala asked Suraji that Soli, who of the two Bombay judges did take to Indra on his side? It so happened that both had actually given it because they were expecting to become future teachers of India under Indira Gandhi's and they were quite enough about power. Now that is where the test attack comes. And Achar Khanna lost his own chief decision. He did not want to become future of India to resign. And his portrait is there this in courtroom number two of the Supreme Court, which that's one of the few portraits that there on the Judge Supreme Court. That's the Achar Khanna's portrait, which is so he had to step down because he was not made in this opinion by the Now that is what is like, we just, I don't think we actually know till a judge or individual is put in that kind of situation to cover him. And that's the test of character. And they didn't even know the Bombay judges in their seat in 20 years or 40 years as to how they will actually be given in that situation. They both trouble. So I think it's individual character, nothing to do with any institution. So it can be that uncle of yours in the family who really stands for the right things all the time. Or that boy or girl in the class who will always write right no matter what. And that kind of thing. Thank you, Mr. Patnaik. Uh, I just take this opportunity because uh, uh, Mr. Patnaik mentioned two things to all the young law students out there. And I'll just recommend two books for you to read. Right? Uh, Mr. Patnaik mentioned about just in Achat Khanna. Right. When you're starting law, uh, I think all of you should have it in your compass the reading list. Grows as a disciple. That's the autobiography of Cheshwar Chakran. Right. Uh, I think that is that that is a good idea. Sir, thank you, sir. Neither knows is not fast. Neither knows is not fast by Chakran. Right. And uh, for the Indian gentleman case, there's a book by Prashant Bhushan called The Case That Should Be Taken, which provides a detailed background of how the politics was shaping up, right? the political background, the political aftermath, and everything that was happening in the judiciary while the case was being decided. So these are two books that I will highly recommend to all the law students out there. Uh, then I move on to Mr. Nain. Uh, Mr. Nain, when we start talking about corruption in the judiciary, uh, also I think it's important for all of us to register that we have two, two grades of judiciary in India right it is going to be a long word. One is the higher judiciary that comprises of the high courts of the Supreme Court. And the other is the lower judiciary or subordinate judiciary or district judiciary, depending on whichever nomenclature you find to be suitable. And uh, the challenges and problems of these judiciaries can be very different. And, and this particular example is a very apt in that case. Uh, it is my understanding that in subordinate or lower judiciary, judicial accountability is there in terms of the fact that action is routinely taken against judges. Judges are suspended, uh, judges are thrown out of jobs, judges are asked to compulsory retire, and uh, there is always, they are always under scrutiny, and the accountability mechanism in terms of their service career is always present. But that cannot be said about the higher judiciary. Uh, since independence, uh, since the time we have the Constitution 1915, till now, we do not have a single High Court or Supreme Court judge who has been removed from office. Now, is it because we have never had a single High Court or Supreme Court judge who has ever corrupted? Right? That's a question which I will ask uh, everybody to wonder about. But considering this reality, considering how incredibly hard it has been to enforce accountability in higher judiciary media. Would you suggest, would you, would you agree 
that maybe there is need to consider alternative modes of accountability. That that going to the parliament, asking the parliament to prove the misbehavior or incapacity of the judge, and a lengthy process of removal, which which doesn't work, which has not worked in date. That that system is defunct. It's not it's not working. That is not creating any deterrent in judges or in the high courts or in the supreme courts. They are fully aware that no matter what they do, the most that they can happen is they will get transferred. That that is the most that will happen for a court judge. They will get transferred. Nothing else. So do you think maybe there is a need to develop alternative modes of accountability? And if yes, what should they be?
thank you so much, Mr. Knight. Uh, Mr. Sal, I'm just going to agree on the same uh, stuff a bit more. Uh, I'm always going to agree, uh, you know, uh, I was doing some research on transfer of high court judgment. And if you look at the collegial resolution, which recommends the transfer of a judge from one high court to another, you find this common phrase which is used in every single order in the better administration of justice. In the better administration of justice. And that always takes me back to the case of Justice Deepkar, who was faced with massive allegations of disproportionate property in And uh, the response of the collegium was to send Justice Deepkar to a uh, okay. 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 Now, this is something that we know anecdotally that I could just don't like to make transfers. Unless it is a, you know, on a track to become the Chief Justice somewhere else, or, you know, unless it is something like that, they do not like to make transfer. But this idea which has germinated that transfer is a punishment. I would like to ask you this. Can transfer be a punishment? Because in my understanding, the service condition of the High Court judge does not change. Whether the High Court judge in Uttar Pradesh, or in Meghalaya, or in Kerala, doesn't matter. My protections remain the same. My salary remains the same. Yes, there might be some variations in the person privileges. For example, in a High Court like Allahabad, where there are close to 100 judges, the number of amenities that is provided to a high court judge might not be the same as that of a high court judge in a notice book, which is a lot, you know, a smaller uh, strength. But this seems to have developed this idea that somehow transfer is a punishment. How do you respond to that? Because there are two ways to look at it. One way is to consider this that this is actually an inconvenience, this is actually a punishment. The other way to look at it is when you project transfer as a punishment, you spare them of the actual punishment that they might deserve. Yeah. The problem is you remove the corrupt judge, particularly the High Court and Supreme Court, very, very difficult task. It has to go to, I mean, the father of both the house of the for the future. That's the reason they put them in the college of this market. That will be how that type of the justice record shall be introduced in the transfer system. Otherwise, the same judges become, I mean, same court become the chief justice of that particular line. Because there is a direct connection between the lawyers and the judges. For any corruption, you see, we had every successful corrupt judge that is a lawyer. The combination is there. Just to break that combination, they want to change that from the judge to transfer to some other line. But the high court, the judge, lawyer can practice the legal court of that. That particular lawyer also can go to other court to appear. And normally it happens how to win the case. Right? I mean, at, uh, it's not proper to have events in the truth. Our, our Bodhi Dharan senior was there. I was there. Uh, Justice Hekde uh, was there. He was not a judge at that time. And Ramaswamy. Sri Ramaswamy is the acknowledged of it. He used to say in the Jaipani Chamber, we the seniors always try to win the case. With what? With the three C's. Three C's is confused. I mean, it confused the judge in our favor. If judge is not confused, confuse the judge. If judge is not confused and keep my favor, corrupt the judge and get on. That's the train of the particular lawyer. If this is the ethos of the lawyers of the country, we got to be saved. So here comes how to catch these groups. The only the technology. Because the technology and the corruption, I mean, you have to declare all the assets, everything is I mean, digitalized. Now the technology, virtual, I mean, hearing will be there. Who is appearing, who is that, how the connection is there. All these things to be exposed. Okay? Some fear will be there, and the only technology will reduce the time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I would 
now I'd like to take the discussion to slightly different perspective. In my own understanding, last month something very interesting happened. Uh, I, I would imagine most of us would be aware about that. Uh, that uh, since the appointment of the new Chief Justice, there's been a lot of chatter, public chatter going on about uh, the collegium's functionality. And as a response to that, the current collegium made public the contents of whatever objections it had received from the government and what was its response to those objections. Now the collegium started publishing its resolutions during the tenure of Justice Deepak Mishra in 2017. Uh, but then somewhere during the tenure of Justice Gogoi, it stopped publishing the collegium resolutions. It turned them into statements. If you go to the website even now, you will see that the PDF from 2017 is the resolutions and the PDF from 2022 will say statements. Now these statements became nothing but more than a press release. Whereas the earlier resolutions carried details that so many advocates have been recommended by a particular high court collegium. Out of those, these many advocates were confirming, these many advocates were rejecting, these were sending it back for reconsideration these being referred, so you could get a sense of who are the candidates for consideration, what decision is being taken from them. But since Justice Gogoi, it had become something extremely banal, no different than a press release from the government of India saying these are your judges, etc. This was something very different after a long period. And here is, my, here is where my question emerges. In the 21st century, where people have information about everybody. Okay. And people want to know everything about everybody. Our judges live in almost obscurity. We did a paper on titled on a very simple question. Who are our judges? What do we know about our judges? For example, you know, even a state minister of a department that you don't care about, if you just make some effort, you'll find so many things about them. Which school they went to, whether they're graduated or not graduated, where did they do their graduation? How much did they school? Right? What work did they do? How much money they have? And so many things. And we track about our Supreme Court judges. And they virtually know nothing. And and I again would like to start with uh, Mr. Patnai because you mentioned about the pressure that the judges, judiciary at any point of time, faces from a dominant executive. Today it is one political party, 30 years back it was another political party, tomorrow it is another political party. So the ideology of the party is not the question here, but the fact that there is a dominant executive and the judges are under pressure. And for me, this particular step by the current collegium was an effort to turn public opinion in its favor. A weapon which the judiciary has rarely relied on. So far, judiciary has primarily, the collegium more particularly, has primarily ignored public opinion as a force. Whenever it is facing pressure or anything at all, Engaging with the public, making the public to trust the judges more, getting the public to trust the judiciary more as an institution. Do you think that going ahead in the political climate that we are in or we are likely to be, and in the informational climate that we are also in, right? Where, as a matter of fact, more is known about every public person, public personality than at any point of time in history. Do you feel the judiciary has to do something, take some positive steps to earn, you know, to galvanize that public support for itself, to convince the public that if there is a tussle between the executive and the judiciary, public is better served by trusting the judiciary rather than the executive. Two questions. Uh, the, the traditional thinking is 
that judges should only speak to the judges and ourselves. And when it comes to appointments, uh, it's very that they will become right. When it comes to judicial matters, I think that's still true. That judges should only speak to the judges. You don't have to. They don't have to make public statements to add the track to the judges. I think we are saved in that traditional rule. But when it comes to the appointment process, or say something as unsavory as an allegation is made against a specific judge of the Supreme Court or the High Court, and you don't know how to defend it, because sometimes the facts are not how the media puts it out there. And they do their inquiries, you know, also the inquiries which have been done. And you find very respectable judges coming to the that no, there's nothing that wrong that happened. Uh, so we cannot say that this is something where we need to just catch it. But media is not fixed on the We've had a case where a sexual harassment inquiry was also done against one of the now this is a very very difficult question. The second part, the first part is board judgments. I think we are saying there they should be speaking judgments. The second part which pertains to administrative judgments, whether it's appointments or otherwise, disciplinary action, is a very very difficult area. The reason being that we all know as to how the discourse happens in today's time. It's not a sprint media, it just puts it and lead to a very mature piece in the newspapers next morning or what happened yesterday. You have an economy, you have social media, you have all these very, very motivated uh, interest groups planting stories all the time. In a situation like that, we find even politicians whose job is to control the public's life media, portray things. Also, I'm losing out, we don't have money power, we don't have the kind of uh, manpower and team which is required to control the devices of people who do this. Do you expect any judge, whether it's a district judge or a Supreme Court judge? One thing is for sure, and that, as a lawyer, I can say that their work load is far more than the lawyer's work. The lawyer can choose to take a case, not take a case. I just had to come, home, come down to this side of the room. Uh, seminar here, like this. But they don't have that option. A judge has to still go and sit in court on Monday. An Indian judge is loaded with 40 50 cases of average on a day, if not more. They have to read their files. They have to. You only see them from 10 till about 5 in the, in the court premises. They go home and read these files for the next day. If they have heard matters, they have to pass judgments in the evening. So they work against at night, then at night. They sleep, they get up early in the morning. Again, some reading files. He indicates they have staff at home, blocks at home. It is not possible to give them just a practical the life of a judge's such. And when he becomes a senior judge in the traditional job, it's possible as well inside him. It is not possible for him to do media matters. It's what I think is a practical way of And they're not skilled. Politicians are always thinking about oh, how am I going to see? How do I project myself? A judge is not thinking about that now. He's just thinking about what do I do? I mean, since you're judge, he thinks about how do I decide this case? There's so much of work which I have to do. I don't think they have the way with all. And usually, it's not the way with all. How many media have to do So they cannot compete, they cannot fight the public perception. They just have to speak by the work. And the work should only inspire the people. That's all. But I think it's an important distinction. And, and it's also important for the students to understand this distinction that, you know, even when we talk about separation of powers, uh, judges perform executive functions. So appointment of judges is not a judicial function. It is an executive function. And, uh, you know, the point of Mr. Patak made us a very important one that judges speaking for themselves when it comes to their judicial functions only through their judgment. That's something which is almost sacrosanct. 
Because any compromise on that will open another Pandora. It will, it will, do, it will become too much of a slippery slope for anybody to be able to control it. But uh, it's, a, it's interesting that uh, you mentioned that you know, even if it comes to executive functions, it's just not practically possible for the judges to handle the, the reality that, that surrounds them today. So I'm just, I'm just curious if, if just, uh, sorry, Mr. Nain agrees or disagrees with that point. the work of a judge for imparting justice is to hear from either sides, go through the remarkable citations and come to a logical conclusion. So that is the judicial part. Apart from that, they have to exercise their function as executive side, like uh, the appointment and posting of <laughs> judges to various high courts and to the honorable appellate court. So that is an administrative work exercised by the judges of the honorable appellate court. And if the people at large demand for its openness, well, there is nothing hidden in it and if it is the people of India, they want to know as to why a name is discarded, it can be open, there is nothing hidden in it, the truth can be revealed, but, but while selecting a judge, there are various ways to select. Most of us probably do not know, actually the judgments are scrutinized. The legal profession of the last 10 years is scrutinized of the person who is found suitable. And there are nine types of secret inquiries, including the IB, the CBI, etc., etc., to nominate a judge. So those things, I think, cannot be open. But the rest part, regarding the judgment, regarding the other things, can be open to the topic if required. Thank you. Uh, uh, before I go to uh, just add a point there. Uh, you know, we did some uh, uh, research on the performance and appraisal of judges in subordinate judiciary in postural states in India and how the promotions happen. And as Mr. Naik was mentioning about all these things which I've done, right? and I'm sure that they're done. But one of the features that I have often observed, for example, we, we wrote to the high courts. So when a judge is joined uh, <laughs> a civil judge, there is an entry level judiciary, and he then becomes a senior civil judge, then becomes a district judge. The nomenclature slightly varies from state to state. But this is the broad category. Now, once you become a senior civil judge, to become a district judge, there are two methods. One is you write a limited competitor examination, which is open only to senior civil judges by around five years of experience. So if you qualify that exam, then you will become a district judge. Otherwise, you wait for your term in terms of seniority. So that takes longer. So it's also something that in academic circles is known as accelerated promotion. The regular promotion is in the regular time frame, whichever is prescribed, you will become a judge and on the basis of seniority primarily. The other is seniority is not the concern. If you have the minimum numbers of eligibility, then a test will be conducted, an exam will be conducted, simultaneously that of the regular district judiciary examination that lawyers write. And if you are meritorious, you get selected. Not very good, not <coughs> Now, the reason I ask this question is we asked 12 high courts in India to share with us the last three years of question papers. Question papers, nothing else. Question papers which have already been done. For example, CLAT happens, past question papers are available. 
right? Any entrance happens past your special paper level. For your judicial services examinations also, for example, court examinations and examinations. Past your special papers are in public domain, contracted by the public service commission. <coughs> Not a single high court was ready to show. <coughs> Not one high court was ready to share the question paper which they just refused. They just said no. Now my question comes from where? That can steps like this be taken which will create more confidence in people? Which is slightly different from the point that Mr. Patnaik made which I think I kind of agree with. That it's not for individual judges to media management. But is it possible for the judiciary both at the higher judicial level and at the low judicial level to take up institutional policies of disclosure which will just make things, make people have more confidence in the process. Because for a common person, if these are exam question papers which you have given to school and they're done, you don't want to repeat your question papers, then why are you not sharing them? By withholding that information, by withholding that information, you're creating doubt. Even though there might not be anything fishy actually. Right? And that's when we realize that at times it is possible that secrecy has become the default position. Even when nothing is wrong, it's not that something fishy has gone on, not necessarily. But more and more, secrecy, not revealing things, not disclosing things, has kind of become the default position of the judiciary. So Mr. Sao, yeah? but how do you respond to this particular thing? The first time I could hear how the question paper is already over, the exam is over, I could, I don't think he can hold it. Why did the IA disclose it? Because for future lawyers, they will prepare for the exam. Like ah, it is open, IAT is open, every UPS is open. So what is the secrecy? Interview part, of course, you can do that. But that also what an interview you can keep so that the better benefit is student will come. So it's absolutely wrong on the part of the high court who says no, but right to the chief justice. If the chief justice of the high court doesn't respond, Right to the Chief Justice of India. Chief Justice of India today is put in a different one. He will respond to you. This particular research happened around seven years ago. Yes. So, so I'm just. Now, you know, seven years ago, the data was put in different. The data was put in different. Now it's put in different. Am I wrong, sir? No, no, no. Please write to the Chief Justice of India. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good point to make that. Yes. It's a comfortable position. And nobody questions beyond a point, so it's fine. So, more information means more questions. More accountability. And people don't know. They don't know. That, that's what we do. I think, yeah, Mr. Sahu, I think, is analyzing me. In saving times, people will ask for more information. Uh, courts also, as the new mindset that is also, is that yes, sunlight is the best. Let's give things out there. So things out there. And one more thing I just want to add here is that, yeah, with regard to, like you start your question with the appointment process as to how things are put out there um, with regard to certain appointments. I didn't also give it out the first time, you know, which you said John Powell, that there's a social secret. I think one thing has intrigued me and uh, <coughs> Yes, when you reject a candidate, if you say something negative about a candidate, it could be a subjective thing. And it may affect the standing of that person at the bar to continue as a lawyer. If you're not picking up somebody to become a judge, uh, the judge only of a high court, or the judge of a high court, to become a Supreme Court judge. And if you say, give reasons, how does he function as a judge or a judge of a high court? That's bad. But one thing that to do, I always thought, just to add a little bit of imagination, is that why can you not be a positive business why can you That also is not given. You say they just say these are people who picked up. Now you don't have to say the reasons why you're not picking up something. You can always say these are the reasons why you're picking up Mr. A or Mr. B or Mr. C. 
the once you do that, at least people know outside that this is the reason as to why people are reasonable, which will inspire more confidence. I think that could be a first step, starting step, with regard to human transparency. And then you have right nothing to fix that up. That's the small question. So I, I think that that's a very excellent point. Because, you know, why we are picking a particular person in Deloitte to judge? Because it's a success issue. How many death row convicts he has got off on a team? How many judges in the trial court he has reversed with the court? Why he has taken, he's done so many labor matters, pro bono, and all these works. Some kind of, that will kind of provide that clarity. Some information that as to what went on in the minds of those who were appointed by appointing somebody. So I, I, I think that that's, that's a very good suggestion. Uh, I'm taking the liberty of changing the track here a bit. Uh, the topic is role of the judiciary in a changing world. And in the last three years, nothing has changed us as much as technology has. Uh, since the beginning of pandemic, we have encountered technology seeping into almost every single unit of our existence. And we started doing things which we never imagined we will do through technology. When I started my academic career, I would have never imagined conducting an online class. Right? Where I am sitting with a you know, with a, in my in my house, keeping a laptop on the stool and talking to students. Half of which have switched on their cameras, half of them have not switched on their cameras, and you know, to try and connect, right? <coughs> but the fact of the matter is, the disruption of pandemic has also disrupted our judiciary in a massive way. Uh, Mr. Knight, when he was standing here, was talking about the integration of virtual courts, right? E filings, and, and many things like that. Whereby infrastructure is slowly being created where lawyers will not have to travel physically to a particular place in order to argue. Now there have been two sides to this argument. Uh, one argument is that it is highly democratizing, it's liberating. Because now a lawyer sitting in Kyunja doesn't have to travel to Qatar in order to argue in front of Qatar. He can do it from there itself. So as a, as, a, as a long term force, it is highly democratizing because it will equalize access unlike anything. Because we can't have a high court in every human corner of the state. We can't have a Supreme Court in every state in the, in the country. So technology, adoption of these technologies can democratize. But the counter argument has also been given that this capacity of lawyers to sit in their room, sit in their office, and argue matters throughout the country has concentrated briefs to some lawyers who already had a head start in terms of being already successful, being already in road name. So earlier if I had to fly a hot shot lawyer from Delhi to argue matter in uh, Qatar, that at times would involve flying that person in for that person to suspend that his or her work there, coming to Odessa, staying here, <coughs> arguing the matter, Maybe not being able to argue the matter because the court is closed for reference, right? Those inconveniences have collapsed, which means that those who can afford yeah. can hire those same set of lawyers for more matters. Yeah. How how can the judiciary? What should be the response of judiciary to something like this? Yeah. Adoption of technology has its challenges, has its benefits. How can the judiciary respond? Start, Mr. Sarkar. Thank you. Dr. Brown, any lawyer can appear for any distance. He appears for a particular case, he is engaged by the litigants. So, nothing wrong with that. But the, now the problem comes the so called uh, high profile lawyers sitting abroad are being before the Supreme Court of India. Coming some content, how can you deal with that? Because we don't have that kind of uh, understanding due to the foundation. If somebody is in Africa, sitting in Africa, if you just the judge, 
our boys are no less sitting in Africa and they can sit there and do images do the virtual hearing. How to deal with that? That was the only for good legislation, good understanding with the nation has to come. With the technology that developed, for Chief Justice of India doesn't realize today the virtual hearing is okay. Inside the country, the law is repaired anywhere. You can deal with that. For the litigants. Earlier, the litigants also argued themselves to the Supreme Court on their own. Now, some politicians come and they don't get the favorable order. They throw a chapel and they get the judges. So, immediately, these days, two, three bodyguards are there to control the lawyers. Yeah, litigants, particularly. So, these things we have to deal with. I mean, only the Supreme Court can think of it. The virtual is okay, but at the same time, negative effect is also. Mr. Knight. Necessity is the mother of invention. So when the pandemic period started, this online sports started on selling. So people in the Western Odisha, particularly when they demanded a physical high court over there, that demand, which involves lots of a huge amount of money, can now be said that you can have the matter or you can file your case by e docket to the Honorable High Court directly. So coming to the High Court by spending the money of the client is not required. You can take your fees and you can argue the matter directly from your home or, to, or from your chambers of office whatsoever. So online courts have started video conferencing. Our cases have already started in the lower court level. But as Mr. South said, a lawyer who is abroad, outside India, and he starts abusing, his behaving. So that matter, I think, will be again thought of, and whether this will develop very soon, as we expect, and we have the belief that the present CJI, Honorable General Chu, will definitely have a way of to solve all these issues. Thank you. On a lighter note, maybe you know we'll need that first piece of it just being a news for a solution to be found. <laughs> uh, I think uh, the downsides are far uh, lesser than the upsides of what technology has have been open and see lawyers arguing from anywhere. I think uh, for me personally the most satisfying thing is to see a lawyer who has their authority of matter, either the district court level or the high court level. Even if it's in his usual he wants to argue the same case and wants to argue the same case from his own place at the Supreme Court because he has had the fight and the way sometimes you can present it is much better. But early to the, the physical instance, with the financial things. And I remember many times, as, even as a young lawyer, reading this and me and prepared by something, argue, and come out, he's get dismissed. The lawyer in Odisha who sent to the case, who had to send to the case, I think he went easy with it. That's what happened. So there's no wrong. That there are people who control the briefs or who were just sent in Delhi or sent in Dhaka who had access to the school because of the location advantages and uh, certain advantages of uh, background or things which happens also in the profession. When not enough, either to the lawyers who sent the brief or the clients, so it's not just the lawyers who can argue, it's also clients who can see. That's a huge change. When, when a client, when we argue with the court, most of the time the clients are not. So the client does not know. He sent a lot of money to you, please you are with you. Give some story, etc. But he can now switch on and see what's happening to you. And that is a very huge uh, upside of the way you are. So as Mr. Naik rightly said, that I think Justice General is, uh, as a different mindset, 
that we expect in the use technology is much, much better. Than that. I know the connected node recently the Supreme Court started live streaming of all constitutional vegetables. Uh, going ahead, do you know the panel members think that should be the norm for all courts everywhere in India? We have, we, we, we have all kinds of things being streams. Apparently, I have I'm not, not much of the social media, but I have been told that people stream brushing their teeth, right? Having a toast. Packing the cat, right? All kinds of things are being streamed online. Uh, so, so I would just like to give you a feedback on that. That do you think? Because the downside is also there because we now see more needs of judges online, right? We see the videos of judges on uh, on YouTube, right? Where judges that I know are becoming YouTube stars, and you can have all kinds of comments. Right? It's a public forum, so all kinds of comments can come in about the judge. So there are it's not necessarily something which is purely good. There are downsides. You're exposing yourself to certain possibilities when you do that. So how do you think the judiciary should go about it? Is it is it an idea that we should aspire to to achieve in a phase manner? The virtual phone, the online phones are functioning now. Now we have got the Judicial Academy. Even the High Court judges are supposed to be trained how they should behave in a manner to suit their standards. standards. It's not that you think the officers will get in the uniform, who is the SP. The moral of the force will affect. So even the High Court judges, they should also know how to behave. Apart from the lawyers, lawyers of course, it's very difficult to work in control. But it's not expected from the high court judges. There are also publicity money. In PIF, I have seen many high court and Supreme Court judges became a publicity money. And they pass some, and during the discussions, some pass some comments. That comment also comes, but the fruits, I mean, the background doesn't come. That's a dangerous thing. So, when they read the comments, they should be very, very careful and they should be trained properly in the judicial academy. Earlier, the hypothesis was not agreed that we know everything, we know how to be trained. Now, the judicial academy, when they started in the Mubar, every hypothesis, the Supreme Court has to be trained. Continuation of education is also required. So, it's not that if you only know the judicial is also trained, hypothesis is also trained. Because they look at that much of exposure, what the lower judiciary has. And the discipline maintains itself, the discipline is not there to the high court judges because the directly from the bar they join as a high court judge. So the discipline training would be, I mean, gradually it will come up. This is the starting phase. They are not seeing the virtual, they started giving comments. The egocentric is also there. Now the Supreme Court said that every thing actually of calling the officers is not good because. The ego is there. So that should be uh, that should be the background of the jazz. So it should be taken from. So I currently you are presiding over the judicial forum. So I think this is a question that you know applies to you go directly then it applies to anybody else. So suppose there was a proposal to compulsorily live stream all your businesses. How do you think? Do you think this is something which should be useful to the forum? Will, will it pose challenges to you? How do you think it will affect you? One thing I would like to say is that uh, in between the bench and the bar, though we are said to be the two sides of a coin, uh, there is a discrimination. That is, the lawyers are paid to say, to speak, and we are paid to listen. On. So in that way, we have to have patience, tolerance, perseverance, and we should not act abruptly and should not summon anyone like that because we have that power. Of course, it is when it is required very much in a case, we can, but not in that manner, in an way, we can summon anyone, we, can, we should not disturb anyone and 
according to the code hackle level. So sensitization in that aspect is very much required. And Mr. Sahu said that the honorable judges also are required to be sensitized or trained in this aspect. Thank you. Uh, just a kind of nudge you a bit to, to, to respond to the question. Let's say in your district of the Bulletin's report, now we propose that all the people should be next to you. Do you foresee some challenges in this? Can that be Do you think it will affect the people to the proceedings in this? Yeah, of course. Uh, now, at present, uh, as because I am the president of this consumer, this good federation committee, that the act itself, uh, that is provisional data that we should mind our behaviors in the commission, we should not act abruptly, and we should have a present hearing to either side. Cases of consumer are now <coughs> growing rapidly because each and every citizen is now conscious that whatever he or she purchases or the services which he or she hires, if there is any latches there regarding the price, quality, etc., etc., it can buy a consumer food. Yes. So, if that will is there and there are a lot of developed procedures as for the Consumer Protection Act 2019, which has Awarded in the past <coughs> Act of 1986. So, if this type of behavior is formed, in my considered opinion, it is better to keep silent or to come to the chapters by putting the commission till the matter is pacified. Yeah. Thank you, Mr.
judgment comes in our favor. Now, what media unfortunately does is that takes those lines and puts it as if the judge is the judge. And it's their principles of this. Now, that's a problem which we might face because judges might become restrained in their exercise of judging and the process which happens. That inhibition is something which I mean, it's one thought which is also happening, but I think that and sometimes judges have to be also very, very aggressive. So, this life really seems to be a very, very suicidal manner. But many judges can be very, uh, very abrupt, very aggressive. That's how the best judges I've ever I've not seen them. I've seen them, 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 I've seen Judges that we have. So, judges in doing the role of judging sometimes get very, very aggressive and abrasive, also, which is not only the argument that the right. So, maybe they will start behaving better. They have to do the same job. Thank you so much. Uh, it has been absolutely a pleasure. I have so many more questions that I would like to ask. But I understand we are running short of time. So uh, uh, maybe we can uh, invite some yeah. questions from the audience. Uh, so uh, is, is there a volunteer who can uh, help us pass the money around? Anybody have any questions? Anybody from the audience would like to ask any question? Uh, I would just request you to introduce yourself, state the question briefly, and also if preferable, you know, request which panel member you uh, prefer answering that question. Thank you. 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 Now there is no witnesses in Bharat from Bharat court and to give their, but, give their opinions. There are so many reasons. Uh, in, uh, even in front of him or in, in the brutal nails, the motor is happening, every time he did not. All are looking, all are saying, but they are about it. Uh, because they don't want to be hurt by the police or to go again and again to court. And to, is there any provision any policy on the other state to encourage them or to reward them or to ensure that they will be uh, free and free and they will, there will be no harm to them? Uh, recently on the case, Mumbai's small water case, like this. Mr. Mayak, would you like to take that? As you said, recently there is a discussion regarding that witness is being given protection. The sensitive witness is not being brought to the court, rather is asked to give his witness right from the video conferencing system place and his identity even can be kept secret without being disclosed. So he is there only to give his witness opinion regarding the occurrence and he will be processed by the concerned lawyer for the defense. So in that way, he will not waste his time, energy and should also be out of fear that he is not going to face any difficulty in future. So that has been developed. Any other questions? Thank you so much. My name is Rajeshwam, Rajeshwamana, CBI Honours. We, we all know about 2611 attack on Taj, uh, Taj Hotel and Indian police also caught it in his name as Asmal Kassar. So my question, my question is that why did it take 4 years to get him hanged despite we have solid evidences? Very good. Uh, yeah, that's a question which I think a lot of people ask in the media, everywhere. But we have a process. 
a, a, a judicial process by which we have to be something like that. If you compromise that process in one case, and say everybody knows this is the person, this hanging. There may be a demand for similar summary justice to be done in another case where facts may not be as clear. So once you compromise a principle in one case, you open up the possibility of compromising in every case or every other case because that demand will come in the For the person who is a victim or whoever thinks that this is how they are like that. So the law does not make a distinction. Even if you see somebody doing a broad day murder, okay, there are hundred witnesses, you still have to go through the process to arrive at I, The case that I started out with my senior when I joined the bar 20 years back was the Palm attack case, Palm bombing case. I remember I was lost taking the law exam uh, when the bombing happened. We came out and we the Palm attack. It was the third Palm attack. I mean, maybe you guys were. 20 years, maybe we will not know. It's another era also. Yes, but uh, this happened in 2002. Not about the time, I think. No, December. Some plan, not until this year. Till December, yeah. you lost the message. Now there were five people who were convicted, uh, who were accused. And we were the process, I was part of the prosecution team. Okay. Like a young member of the prosecution team. By the time the matter reached the Supreme Court, out of five, three were acquitted. Two were acquitted. Now, so everybody is very clear this bombing has happened, somebody is behind it, or of course they had to catch hold of it. It was a investigation of Sir Rajbir Singh. Okay. Picked up his honor in three days' time. There was formal observer, if you observe, observe guru, you make contact with him. Shokhat was said to him, Arsan Sandhu, who is a wife, a Punjabi wife of Shokhat was said to him. There is Professor Kilani, who was there. He's there for his life. So ultimately, Professor Kilani of Delhi University and Arsan Sandhu got acquitted in those. So when everything is so clear cut at the beginning and so much witness there is a confession statement signed and all that, when you go through the processes and reach the top, you realize that some of these evidences don't add up. So yeah, there are cases where when you follow the process, you realize that there are innocent people who have got as they used to and which we don't have enough control against them. In fact, Mr. Nair, he must have done session trial. But he would be in a much better position than me if he even had to do that. To add, Mr. Patnayak, actually the process, judicial process, the lengthy process is now being cutted during, during this uh, electronic era. And uh, this lengthy process, summoning the witness, the witness do not turn, do not turn off on the dead. On the dead, the judicial officer or the magistrate who is trying the case is on leave, has gone on training and gone on conferences. So in that way, the case lingers and lingers. So now it is being processed that uh, there should be, uh, now that cases are targeted, suppose five year old, ten years old, they are targeted and monitored strictly. And this lengthy process is being cutted very shortly. There will be some solution for this. And I would like to suggest rather that as we are having this uh, court time from uh, 10 o'clock to 5 o'clock and closing it at 5 o'clock like the offices, it will be better to follow round o'clock, not in the night, but early in the morning to have shift courts and the judicial officer be coming to the shift courts and the case can be processed accordingly. So uh, there is now uh, processes taken up, like uh, summoning witness through WhatsApp messages, even through mobile phones or telephone messages, not by sending this postal summons. So in that way, we are developing and still within a short span, I think this
process, delay process will be cut. Thank you. Any other questions? My question is, in this electronic media era, is it enough for a judge to make a decision whether when all the evidences are against the accused? When all the evidences are against the accused, then is it enough for a judge to sentence the sentence or make the final judgment against him? And if the accused is an influential person of that area or a political leader or anything else, then is it uh, is it reliable that a judge decision can be biased? Each and every citizen is equal and usually people of my temperament will never prefer to go down to any influence. So I think there are many judges even of that temperament who will never go down. Very few, of course very few. But when the evidence is all against the accused, no one can help him and he will be convicted, undoubtedly. All the evidences are against him. Now, the person who is to ask the questions or request Kirby to come. Acceptable to both people. 
which has more broad based so, appeals. Judiciary is not a politics, they are the politician. They always see the pro bono, they always see the larger interest of the public. They have the judicial reason, judicial visionary people. They take a decision whether to take up the case or not. This is the, none of the business of the, those who are criticizing it. They can criticize in the court, and of course, positive criticism is also required. But many a times, judiciary is doing very well in PIL. And uh, because of many PILs, many of their problems of the society is being uh, I mean, controlled and uh, uh, streamlined from. already overshot by five minutes. So it has been an extremely enriching uh, experience for me as well. And I hope the same was with all of you. So I will request no girls it's no great some exposure anymore. Are they doing law or are they benefit? They will interact after the session and panel members are available. I request the uh, lively discussion. I now request Professor Viswati Patnai, founder and president of ASPM University, to finally come to the dais to participate the guests.